Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. We're here today to remember and to celebrate the life of Marion Candido. Marion died on the 14th of September at the age of 80. Her closest friends attended a small private cremation. But today, this memorial is a chance for her friends and her family to get together and to remember her and to honour her long life. Over the years, Marion lived in two countries, thousands of miles apart. As a teacher, both here and in America, she affected many lives. There must be many people all over the world who speak about her with affection, who remember the way that she could illuminate a subject, who remember her sense of humour and the support that she offered to her students, to her family and to her friends. There's a saying that you can light many candles from a single flame. And that's very true of Marion. She touched and influenced so many lives just by being who she was, being herself. And she was so many different people all in one. She was a daughter and a sister and an aunt and a great aunt. She was a wife. She was a teacher, she was a neighbour, and she was a friend. Marion said that she wanted a humanist officiant. So I'm here today from the Humanist UK Network of Celebrants, as she wished, to conduct this memorial ceremony for her. We have a string quartet from the Royal Academy of Music, we have a rolling slideshow of pictures of Marion. We have messages and stories from some of her friends who can't be here today, and readings and tributes as well. I'm going to give an outline of her life story, and we're going to finish with tea and coffee and cakes, something Marion would certainly approve of. And the cakes have all been supplied by one of her favourite tea shops, Boulangerie Jade. We're going to start with a reading, an extract from Under Milk Wood, and Kate is going to read it for us. I'm guessing that it was probably when Marion was at the University of Swansea that she first got to know and love the works of Dylan Thomas. So I'm going to read just a few short passages from the beginning of under Milkwood, and I apologise now for not being Richard Burton, <laughs> or even Welsh, <laughs> for Marion. To begin at the beginning. It is spring moonless night in the small town, starless and Bible black, the cobble street silent and the hunch quarters and rabbits wood limping, invisible down to the slow black, slow black crow-black fishing boat bobbing sea. The houses are blind as moles, though moles see fine tonight in the snouting velvet dingles. You can hear the dew falling and the hushed town breathing. Only your eyes are unclosed to see the black and folded town fast and slow asleep. Time passes. Listen, time passes. Come closer now. Only you can hear the houses sleeping in the streets in the slow, deep, salt and silent black bandaged night. Only you can see in the blinded bedrooms the combs and petticoats over the chairs, the jugs and basins, the glasses of teeth. Only you can hear and see behind the eyes of the sleepers the movements and countries and mazes and colours and dismays and rainbows and tunes and wishes and flight and fall and despairs and the big seas of their dreams. From where you are, 
you can hear their dreams. Thank you. I'm going to talk a bit about Marion's life now. So she was born on the 6th of November, 1940. At the time, the bombing in London was severe and her mother was sent off to Northampton to give birth, returning soon afterwards with the new baby. And Marion claimed that her early experience of bombing raids meant that she could sleep through anything. However, she was also always easily startled by sudden noises, and that was possibly a legacy of her wartime childhood. Her older sister, Margaret, had been evacuated out of London, but she demanded to be allowed to return to London to meet her new sister. The family lived in Plasto, where the girl's father worked at the Tate and Lyle factory, and Marion remembered there was very often a tin of Tate and Lyle's treacle at home. Their mother helped to run her father's haulage business. Marion had early memories of playing around the lorries. As a teenager, Marion had very happy memories of visiting her older sister, Margaret, who was working in repertory theatre all around the country. Marion would stay with her in her lodgings or hotels. There's a photo of her on her bicycle as a young girl in Chesterfield on one of those visits. She also often spoke about staying with Margaret in Paris as well. As a girl, Marion had a German pen friend, Eric, and they wrote regularly throughout their lives. They always kept in touch. And Eric recently wrote, he wrote to Tracy to say, many thanks for sharing the terrible news that I still can't quite grasp. I've known Marion since the 1950s, and from that time we've continued to write frequently to one another. We visited each other on many occasions. From the very start, I got to know Marion and her life through the letters that she wrote, describing her family and her friends and the place where she lived. I quickly grew fond of her dear parents. My visits to London were unforgettable, as were Marion's visits to Bavaria, when we would explore the region together in my car. I often think of the time Marion treated me to a slap-up meal in a fancy London restaurant for one of my big birthdays. It is such a shame that the last trip we planned, Marion wanted to visit me in Germany, was not possible. Marion was a lovable, wonderful lady whom I loved and cherished from the very beginning and I will never forget. Right now, it's simply incomprehensible that she had to leave us. She will be forever in my heart. To you and all of Marion's loved ones, I offer my sincere condolences. It is unimaginable that she is no longer with us. And finally, my heartfelt wish that Marion rests in peace. We are all thinking of her. And we are thankful that we had her in our lives. Marion loved school. She did really well there. And she was very organised and very tidy throughout her life. All her papers were neatly kept, including the Certificate of Merit that she won for verse speaking in 1953 when she was 13. We don't know what poem she read. She said that some of her favourite poets were Dylan Thomas, Wordsworth and John Donne. But it seems an apt moment now to pause for a poem. This is by Noel Coward and Pam's going to read it for us.
This is probably the last poem or anything that Noel Coward wrote, and it's untitled. So today, um, I'm calling it for Marion. When I have fears, as Keats had fears, of the moment I'll cease to be, I console myself with vanished years, remembered laughter, remembered tears. When I feel sad, as Keats felt sad, that my life is so nearly done, it gives me comfort to dwell upon remembered friends who are dead and gone, and the fun we had, and the jokes we had. How, how happy they are, I cannot know. But happy am I who loved them so. Thank you. After she left Sarah Bonnell Grammar School, Marion went to the University of Wales in Swansea, and she graduated in 1963 with an honours degree in political science with subsidiary studies in English and philosophy. She spent the next year here at Goldsmiths, where she not only gained her teaching qualifications, but also a distinction in her teaching practice. And she went on to teach English and French at Lister Technical School in Plasto for the next four years. Apparently, she was also asked to teach PE when she was there, and she was absolutely horrified to find herself teaching children how to throw the javelin. And she had no idea what she was doing and no idea where the javelins were going to end up. Much more enjoyable was taking a group of children abroad on a skiing trip. And then in 1968, Marion decided she wanted a big change in her life, and she set off for America, sailing from Southampton on the SS United States. She kept some of the dinner menus as souvenirs, and in the slideshow of pictures, there's one photo of her in her cabin waiting to set sail. At first, she stayed with family friends, Eileen and Ralph, in their home in New Haven. And she soon started work as a research assistant at the town hall there. And that is where she met John Candido. John came from an Italian immigrant family. He worked in property management and as an antiques dealer. She and John married in November 1981, and so she also became stepmother to his daughter, Kristen. Although she and John divorced in 1996, they kept in touch up until Marion's death. In 1973, Marion started work at the Foot School in New Haven. Many of her pupils were the children of staff at Yale University. The job combining teaching and administration could be very stressful sometimes, especially as she faced some extremely demanding parents. But it was also an incredibly rewarding job. She taught English and modern European history, and she enthralled her students with stories about growing up in London in the Blitz. She continued working at the school until her retirement in 2002, and she was well-liked and well-respected by her colleagues. And we have some wonderful photographs and tributes from them that you can look at later. When she left, the headmaster, Frank Perrine, wrote her a wonderful letter of recommendation. He describes her as absolutely tops, bright, conscientious, always well prepared, witty, sensitive, a gifted conversationalist, insightful, decisive, mature, highly experienced, 
adaptable, has high standards and is not afraid of hard work. It is the best letter of recommendation that you can imagine. It's on the trophy table, so if you want to read it later, you can in full. Marion became an American citizen in 1980, but she also came back to the UK regularly, as her nephew Matthew remembers. And he loved the very American gifts that she brought, jello and bubblegum and instant hot chocolate and, best of all, model characters from the Peanuts cartoons. And he also remembers visiting her in the States and how there was always a warm welcome there. In 2004, Marion came back to England to care for her mother, who was unwell, and she moved back into their house in Lewisham. She hadn't fully decided whether to stay here or go back to America, but in the end, after her mother's death, she settled here back in London and eventually moved into her flat on the Cater Estate in Blackheath. And she really found her place there. She was a familiar and friendly figure to many people in the area. She would chat to anyone. She'd strike up a conversation with whoever was around. She liked to sit on the bench seat facing out onto the street in Costa Coffee. She'd spread out her guardian and she'd get on with the quick crossword or she'd reply to her emails. And that's how she met her friend Jonathan and also Tracy and her daughter Florence chatting in Costa and talking about crossword clues. When Costa was refurbished and the window seat was removed, she started going to other coffee shops and she met and befriended more and more people, staff and customers, at Handmade Food, at Madeleine's, and at Boulangerie Jade. She met people in Boots the Chemists as well. She would talk to everybody and befriend them. And our next speaker, with reflections on friendship, is Tracy. A couple of weeks after Marion passed away, Women's Hour ran a feature about the benefits of intergenerational relationships. And I immediately thought about my friendship with Marion. We were at very different points in our life when we first met in 2006. I was in my 30s with four young children, juggling work and family life, outfits thrown together because I was always running late. Marion was in her 60s and already enjoying the leisurely benefits of retired life. Um, as Steph said, we first met in Costa Coffee, where I would arrive after school drop-off, dishevelled and harassed, dragging a toddler in one hand and a Labrador in the other. Marion, on the other hand, would be poised serenely and stylishly at the window seat with her coffee and her guardian, crossword half done. Despite these apparent differences, we hit it off straight away. In fact, we had a lot in common. We were both school teachers and had each done our teacher training at Goldsmiths, albeit some 30 years apart. We both spoke French and German and had spent considerable time in those countries. Over coffee and cake, we discussed the latest news and views from around the world. It turned out we had a very similar outlook on life. More importantly, we shared a love of fashion and makeup and spent many a happy hour shopping on the King's Road or mooching around the village, browsing the sales racks in Whistles and Jigsaw. Imagine our delight when Space NK opened in Blackheath. <laughs> Marion had an incredible sense of style. She was elegant and well-dressed at all times and was always on the lookout for a new lippy. She loved to share her latest finds and my only regret is that we didn't share the same dress or shoe size. 
We did share a sense of humour, though, and I never laughed as much as I did with Marion. She was incredibly sharp-witted and had a dry sense of humour, but could also be silly and sometimes a little bit rude. She loved a double entendre, as she called it. And our, our attempt at sophisticated conversation with Jonathan and Toby inevitably ended up in what Marion liked to call filth. <laughs> My relationship with Marion was really quite unique. She was like a best friend, a sister, and a mother figure all rolled into one. But without the competitiveness of the school gates, the rivalries of a sibling, or the filter of a parent-child, no topic was off limits. We could chat for England. During lockdown, I saw or spoke to her every day. And to the amazement of my husband, we were never at a loss for something to talk about. Marion was an engaging storyteller and had a superb memory. She loved to tell stories of her childhood in the East End or her time in the States. Jonathan always said we should record our chats and turn them into a book, and how I wish we had. In times of crisis, she provided unconditional and unwavering support. She offered wise counsel based on her own experiences. She was never judgmental, and all advice was given with love and kindness. Marion dealt with her illness the way she lived her life, with quiet courage, strength, and dignity. It was an incredible privilege to share the last few, week, last few months of Marion's life with her. We spent the time just hanging out and talking about life, looking at old photographs and sharing stories and memories. We would sit on her bed in the evenings, drinking tea and watching films together. She never lost her sense of humor, and despite her increasing frailty, those precious days were filled with fun and laughter. Marion passed away on my 49th birthday, but not before she surprised me with a little birthday gift, which we opened around her bed in the early morning. Turns out she had managed to squeeze in one last shopping trip to Space NK, albeit via the magic of the internet. The photograph here and on the, the front of the orders of service were um, taken at my 40th birthday party. And as you can see, Marion threw herself into the 1940s theme with pizzazz. My 50th next year will be bittersweet and her absence will be keenly felt. But I will be eternally grateful for that special friendship that enriched my life and made me stronger, wiser, and just a little bit more stylish. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We'll have some music now. This is the... Canon in D by Packle Bell.
As you've heard, Marion always enjoyed shopping. John Lewis was a particular favourite. She was elegant, she was well-dressed, she liked nice clothes, shoes, and she always had two bags, one small one and a larger one in case she bought something. <laughs> and to tell the truth, she would often hang the larger bag over the back of a chair and then forget about it. But everybody soon learnt that if there was an abandoned bag in a coffee shop, it belonged to Marion, and she'd get it back eventually. She was never seen without her lipstick, and she often accessorised with pretty scarves tied stylishly round her head. And she liked gadgets, so Lakeland was a regular haunt. And she also enjoyed buying random articles from TK Maxx and then recycling things round the various charity shops. She had a real eye for interior design, she enjoyed refurbishing her flat and upcycling her furniture. And Toby spent many a patient hour driving her to furniture and DIY stores and remodelling her kitchen and her bathroom. She always kept up with current events, reading The Guardian and more recently The Eye. And she listened to Radio 4. On television, she enjoyed a good Scandi Noir and, of course, the tennis. Over the last weeks, she watched the US Open, and she was thrilled when little Emma won the women's title. She always watched Wimbledon. She enjoyed travel. She visited various places in Europe, though she commented that the coffee shops in Portugal aren't nearly as good as the ones here. She used to visit Matthew and Liz in Oxford, and she helped to coach their sons, Luke and Ben, for exams. She had a lively sense of humour, and there would often be laughter and joking round the dinner table. Matthew says she could sometimes be appropriately vulgar, which could be very funny. Luke isn't able to be here today, but he says they had a lot of laughs together, and he misses her immensely. Life wasn't always straightforward. Marion faced difficulties and anxieties at times, but she found friendship and support, and her last years in Blackheath were happy and settled. At home, she enjoyed being out and about and shopping and having coffee, going into town, and then home for dinner and a good TV drama. And when Matthew was working in Kent, he'd often stay with her, so they saw each other quite frequently. Marion always kept in touch with her brother-in-law, Alan, and she'd visit him in Eastbourne when she could. And Beachy Head and the surrounding areas held treasured memories of family holidays with her parents and her sister. Her brother-in-law, Alan, has sent this mini-eulogy for Marion. He writes, I first knew Marion at the age of eight. She was and remained adorable, full of a family-wide sense of integrity. She later became the sister I never had. One of the most memorable epitaphs I have ever seen is at a grave close to that of Sir Winston Churchill, and it reads, she did what she could. For Marion, I'd say the same, only to add, she could and did do a great deal with her life. She is much missed. There have been many, many messages and memories from friends all around the world. So here are just a few of them. Linda Rain wrote to Matthew to say, I have very fond recollections of spending time with Marion in the 90s. We had some good times together. And I saw her a few times when I was in London visiting Blackheath. I know she was very close to your sons and I'm sure that you'll all miss her very much. 
May her memory be a blessing. Linda Johnson, who knew her from foot school, remembers she had the best sense of humour ever, and I think that was part of her success with kids at that age. This message came from Amy Sudmeyer, who says, I remember her incredible high standards, her untouchable personal poise, and her warmth as a teacher. She really taught me grammar. And Frank Perrine, the former head of the school, wrote, besides being an unusually good teacher, she had a great touch with students and was a very popular and successful faculty member. She went on to head up the upper school for many years with great flair and confidence and wisdom. She always made life a bit brighter and happier for us all. We'll have some more music now. Albinoni's Adagio in G minor.
In 2019, Marion was first diagnosed with cancer. She went through surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, often on her own because of lockdown, but supported by Tracy and Toby. She was given the all clear, but then earlier this summer, it became apparent that her health was deteriorating and she was diagnosed with terminal liver cancer. Towards the end of her life, when she couldn't get around much, Marion found peacefulness in just being at home or sitting on her deck in the sunshine under the parasol, quietly absorbed in the world around her. She was such a regular in Blackheath that people noticed she wasn't around. And as they learnt about her illness, many sent good wishes to her. Her friends Tracy and Toby and Jonathan were able to offer her companionship and help and support. And with the help of carers, they enabled her to stay at home where she wanted to be. And she died there peacefully at home. Today we've remembered Marion's life, thinking about what she was like and what she did and how she lived. And I hope that this time together has stirred some of your memories of her and that you will go on thinking about her and talking about her and sharing your stories about her. There are lots of mementos for you to look at on the table here and also there's a notebook on this table. If you would like to write any of your memories or stories or messages, please fill up the notebook. The memorial's coming to an end now, and soon we'll be able to have some tea and cakes, a perfect way to celebrate Marion. And we'll have some more music as well. But first, I'd just like to say thank you for being here. Thank you to everyone who has contributed memories and stories and time and goodwill to make this such a special event. And to bring things to a close, here are some words from one of Marion's favourite poets, William Wordsworth. What though the radiance which was once so bright be now forever taken from my sight. Though nothing can bring back the hour of splendour in the grass or glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. Thank you all. Let's have some tea. <laughs>